Hello, friends. Thank you for joining our study. Uh, we will look at authoritative texts. Uh, of course, any comments are my personal interpretation. For any official or authoritative Baha'i teachings, please visit baha'i.org. Uh, I'd like to thank the Baha'i administration, as well as all of those working for peace. Uh, in the description below, you'll find timestamps of the various sections in this video, so you can jump to those sections if you like. Uh, there's also a link to download an audio form of this presentation, as well as a PDF with all of the quotes. So today we're going to be looking at a topic on ultimate reality in Buddhism. Uh, the quotes and texts that we're actually going to be studying come from what is called the Pali Canon. Uh, this is the central uh, Buddhist texts, uh, which give the foundation for what's called Theravadan Buddhism. They are the most ancient texts we have from Buddhism. There are others that were uh, revealed in Sanskrit, and some that we have in Tibetan and Chinese, uh, which come from the Mahayana tradition. Uh, this is a quick synopsis, whereas this is in the Pali language, and is generally seen to be some of the most ancient authoritative texts of Buddhism. Um, and one of the things that's going to come up a lot for some readers, or some viewers, um, is how different this perspective of Buddhism might be from what they've heard or been told by friends, colleagues, and in general media within the West. Because oftentimes, we, I believe, we see a Buddhism that has been culled, meaning parts of it have actually been chopped off in its presentation to Western audiences. So we often hear that Buddhism is a mere philosophical system, it's not a religion, or it's a uh, system of meditation, uh, even to the point where some people say that uh, a person can be Buddhist and Christian, that because it's actually not religious itself, it's more of a practice or a philosophical system, they can actually blend. Uh, another aspect that we often see is many of the rules and regulations and moral precepts and ritualistic precepts uh, of Buddhism also get removed. So, uh, for example, the Vinaya, which is actually the rules and codes of conduct for uh, monks and nuns uh, of Buddhism. Um, we often also have presented to us a Buddhism that is devoid of judgment. Um, no conceptions of heaven, no conceptions of hell. And uh, bold as it might seem to say, I would suggest that uh, these are actually distortions of the actual Buddhist scripture, and at times, uh, I, I think very unintentionally at times, and this is actually how it's presented in the West, um, to make it more palatable to the Western audience. What we don't often hear of um, in the West, uh, some of the fundamental tenets that I see within the actual Buddha scripture themselves, are for example, uh, the divine status of the Buddha, the uh, necessity of faith and love and even worship of the Buddha, um, the existence of gods. Uh, this is about an ultimate reality in Buddhism, Basically, that there are many topics that we don't see often in the West in common culture that are actually within the Buddhist tradition itself. One of the things we have to do is to place Buddhism in its evolutionary context, to really look at it as part of the Indian religious tradition. Uh, oftentimes, people will say, well, you have to look at Buddhism on its own terms, in its own evolutionary context, but what you end up I have experienced, uh, what you end up seeing is this cult virgin of Buddhism. Um, so I would suggest that it truly is best to actually look at Buddhism within the Hindu, uh, and especially Upanishadic context, context, to see what the Buddha is responding to, what he is correcting, what he is answering, and thereby be able to actually understand the Buddha's claim more clearly. One facet of how Buddhism can be portrayed at times, and again, especially within the West, is the claim that Buddhism is non-theistic. Um, this is a, to me, a, a very peculiar claim, um, that Buddhism is a non-theistic. Not atheistic, not theistic, but non-theistic. Um, in the sense that it doesn't speak of divine beings. Why this is so strange is because if Buddhism is non-theistic, then I would have to say that Greek mythology is non-theistic, that Roman religion was non-theistic, Sumerian or Egyptian uh, religions were non-theistic. Why? Because Roman, Sumerian, Egyptian and Greek mythology, uh, or Norse mythology for that matter, has many divine beings, and so does Buddhism. 
when we actually look within the Pali Canon, we encounter the divine beings that come out of the Hindu Vedic tradition, meaning the tradition that comes from the Vedas, the holy scriptures of Hinduism. So to uh, place a phrase like non-theistic on Buddhism, if I'm going to be just and honest, I'm actually going to have to say, well, it's non-theistic because these people think that there is no ultimate divine one God, but then I would actually have to call Greek mythology and Egyptian mythology non-theistic. So I really do believe that, the, that placing this term on Buddhism is itself just a distortion of actually what Buddhism is saying. So at the very least, we would say that Buddhism is actually polytheistic, meaning it has many, many gods. Because in actual fact, as I, I think we will see, uh, Buddhism has more gods than Greek mythology, more gods <laughs> than Sumerian mythology, and in some sense I would even suggest more divine beings than even Hinduism itself. And of course we're looking at uh, ultimate reality within Buddhism, and again it may seem striking, but that we will be seeing that there is, I believe, a, a very clear conception of an ultimate within the Buddhist tradition, and we'll see what that looks like. So before uh, going into some of the Buddhist scriptures themselves, I believe there's a series of philosophical problems with presenting uh, Buddhism as a non-theistic or atheistic tradition. Um, one of those things is sort of related to uh, the Western conception of deism. The idea that, well, there might be an ultimate reality, uh, but that ultimate reality is not concerned with human existence, is actually not an intervening being, not a being that relates to its creation in any direct way. More like, if you will, the grand architect, or the mathematical being that is behind the laws of the universe and rationality. Um, why I find this uh, untenable is because, first of all, just like the problem with deism itself, um, the question arises, well, is there a moral code? Are there virtues or qualities that we re refer to as virtues that actually have to be manifested and, if you will, exemplified within a human life in order to ascend towards this being, or to be of, of a greater fulfillment of our life? And I think the answer, both for the deists um, in the early modern philosophical era, as well as within Buddhism, the answer is yes, that we're supposed to see people as ends, not as means. We're supposed to be just and honest and compassionate. We're supposed to uh, seek truth and duty and responsibility and sacrifice for the good of all. Uh, all these are represented with Buddhism and within a lot of deistic writings. But all those things have to do with how we treat each other. Uh, all those things have to do with how we relate to each other as human beings, so that we can be in accord or congruent with the reality that we're supposed to be, which means that the laws that we're looking at are directly related to human beings themselves. There are truths about human beings and how we should act within this world, and these derive from, if you will, deism, or in Buddhism, from the Dharma. So if we are in any way beholden to the teachings of of virtue and sacrifice, uh, then we have what I would call like an ontological ethic. Something outside of us that we are actually beholden to, which seems to cause, I would suggest, very large philosophical problems for a complete absentee landlord conception of a, say, law-like or mathematical principle behind the universe. Um, it's, this is what I, what I would call the problem of the Dharma itself. Another aspect uh, that comes up with relationship uh, to Buddhism uh, is the concept of a bodhisattva. Uh, a bodhisattva, which does appear within the pages of the Pali Canon, is a being who, uh, under the teachings of the Buddha, has ascended through a purification of themselves, of a, of a, a disentanglement with this world, and an embodiment, sorry, an embodying of the principles of compassion and non-attachment. Uh, they reach a place where they are able to actually pass into the realm of nirvana. They can finally leave the world of what's called samsara, uh, the realm of birth and rebirth, of death and suffering, 
um, but they choose not to. And when they choose not to, they do so out of compassion for all other human beings. In fact, all living things. Their entire um, focus is actually to ensure that they stay within the realm of suffering and within the realm of trials in order to sacrifice themselves for the raising up of all beings and bringing them towards a true understanding of the Dharma. The Buddha himself does this. Uh, at the beginning of his mission, he is able immediately to pass into Nirvana. But he actually stays for the sake of those who might see. So the question would be, I think, do the Bodhisattvas, who choose not to enter the realm of Nirvana, but rather to stay in this world and sacrifice out of love and compassion, do this in accord with what the Dharma really says. And I think when we look at the Buddhist scriptures, we have to agree that they do. That the Buddha, when he actually chooses to actually remain in this world, although he can leave the realm of samsara, of aging, sickness, death, and trial and suffering, he chooses to stay in contrast to what Mara, this figure Mara tells him to do, which is to release himself from suffering, because no one will listen. That Mara really is the figure of, if you will, Satan within the Buddhist writings, because Mara tempts the Buddha, telling him not to stay, not to follow his compassion, his sense of justice and love, but rather to either pass into Nirvana, into death, in a sense, um, or to actually take money wealth and power. It's very much like the testing of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. So this section is a, a look at the Buddhist scriptures uh, and other scriptures in the context of Baha'i texts. So looking at what, say, Abdu Baha or Baha'u'llah or Shoghi Effendi or the World Center might say, and taking a, a look at what is the nature and validity of the Buddhist scriptures. Uh, oftentimes I have uh, met friends of mine who actually think that the Buddhist scriptures are corrupted or uh, inauthentic or unreliable. And we really want to take a look at this to examine some principles from the Baha'i scriptures themselves. So this first scripture, or this first quotation is from Abdul Baha. In the Divine Holy Books there are unmistakable prophecies, giving the glad tidings of a certain day in which the promised one of all the books would appear. A radiant dispensation be established, the banner of the most great peace and conciliation be hoisted, and the oneness of the world of humanity proclaimed. Among the various nations and peoples of the world, no enmity or hatred should remain. All hearts were to be connected one with another. These things are recorded in the Torah, or Old Testament, in the Gospel, in the Quran, in the Zendavesta, and the books of Buddha. In brief, all the holy books contain these glad tidings." So just quickly, several different scriptures are actually mentioned here, uh, one of them being the books of the Buddha, that actually there are prophecies and foretellings and glad tidings of a day in these holy books, again one of them being the books of the Buddha. Secondly, uh, Shoghi Effendi. Any good Orientalist could probably refer you to commentaries on the Qur'an and on the Buddhist scriptures. So in the discussion that the Guardian, Shoghi Effendi, is having with an individual, he's suggesting that someone look out, uh, or sorry, seek out commentaries on the Buddhist scriptures, ostensibly to actually help them uh, understand what these scriptures say. Once again, because they are a holy receptacle of writings. This is from the work One Common Faith, commissioned by the Universal House of Justice. The scriptures have not changed. The moral principles they contain have lost none of their validity. No one who sincerely poses questions to heaven, if he persists, will fail to detect an answering voice in the Psalms or in the Upanishads. Anyone with some intimation of the reality that transcends this material one will be touched to the heart by the words in which Jesus or Buddha speaks so intimately of it. 
So we actually have four dispensations actually represented here. The first is uh, the Psalms, which is from the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, uh, the Upanishads, which we will be looking at in this, in this study, but as well the words of Jesus and Buddha, that anyone who poses a question to heaven to try to understand and to commune with their Creator can hear an answer from within the Upanishads, the Torah, the Buddha scriptures, or the New Testament. So this next quote is actually from Baha'u'llah. Now it doesn't speak directly of Buddha scriptures, but it puts forward a principle, a, if you will, a covenantal principle that we have to consider when assessing the validity of these, form, validity of these former holy books. And should they reply, the books that are in the hands of this people, which they call the Gospel, and attribute to Jesus, the son of Mary, have not been revealed by God, and proceed not from the manifestations of his self, then this would imply a cessation in the abounding grace of him who is the source of all grace. If so, God's testimony to his servants would have remained incomplete, and his favor proven imperfect. His mercy would not have shone resplendent, nor would his grace have overshadowed all. For if, at the ascension of Jesus, his book had likewise ascended unto heaven, then how could God reprove and chastise the people on the day of resurrection, as hath been written by the Imams of the faith and by his illustrious divines?" This quote is responding to a claim we sometimes hear from the Islamic community, uh, that the New Testament, the Gospel itself, uh, is not in the hands of the Christians. That when Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven, well, his message ascended with him, and we have only faint and corrupted echoes uh, of that message. Baha'u'llah here is saying this could not be, because this would imply that a secession of the grace, of the source of all grace, would have happened, and that the people of that day could not be held accountable for their acceptance or rejection rejection of the message of the Prophet Muhammad. Now this is a principle being put forward about the authenticity of the New Testament because of its ne the necessary authenticity of it, so that a person could find their beloved in the person of the Prophet Muhammad. But this principle can be carried over. Are we to say that actually the teachings of the Buddha himself actually were completely obscured? that we have lost them completely. Um, because I've heard this again in some conversations where, because there is a passage, uh, where Abdu'l-Baha says that the, the teachings of the Buddha have been lost. But is there a different way to understand this that would not imply a cessation of grace? That the promise made in these holy books, as we saw previously, of the glad tidings of the coming of the Buddha, uh, the great Buddha to come, um, could actually carry humanity within the Buddhist tradition to where they could recognize even, for example, Jesus, or the Prophet Muhammad, or the Bab and Baha'u'llah themselves. This next quote sheds some light upon this question of the teachings being lost. This is from Abdu'l-Baha. Baha'u'llah also established a new religion. Confucius renewed the ancient conduct and morals. But the original precepts have been entirely changed, and their followers no longer adhere to the original pattern of belief and worship. The founder of Buddhism was a precious being, who established the oneness of God. But later his original precepts were gradually forgotten, and displaced by primitive customs and rituals, until in the end it led to the worship of statues and images. This is only the beginning of the quote, but here it sounds, okay, well, they originally came. Now Confucius is different, he renewed ancient customs and moral conduct, but the, Buddhism, Buddhist, sorry, the Buddha himself brought a message to humanity, but that his teachings were lost, his original precepts forgotten. Now if we consider the very next paragraph, uh, Abdu'l-Baha says, Consider, for example, that Christ admonished the people time and again to heed the Ten Commandments of the Torah, and insisted upon their strict observance. Now one of the Ten Commandments forbids the worship of images and statues. 
Yet today there are myriad images and statues in the churches of certain Christian denominations. It is clear and evident then that the religion of God does not preserve its original precepts among the people, but that it has gradually changed and altered to the point of being entirely effaced, and thus a new manifestation appears and a new religion is established. For if the former religion had not been changed and altered, there would be no need for renewal. So immediately after the statement regarding the Buddha's teachings, it's actually applied to Christianity. But that it's actually that these um, observances, these original precepts, have been lost among the people. And again, this is the paragraph immediately following. He continues, In the beginning this tree was full of vitality, and laden with blossoms and fruit, but gradually it grew old, spent and barren, until it entirely withered and decayed. That is why the true gardener will again plant a tender sapling of the same stock, that it may grow and develop day by day, extending its sheltering shade in this heavenly garden, and yield its prized fruit. So it is with the divine religions. With the passage of time, their original precepts are altered, their underlying truth entirely vanishes, their spirit departs. Doctrinal innovations spring up, and they become a body without a soul. That is why they are renewed. Our meaning is that the followers of Buddha and Confucius now worship images and statues, and have become entirely unaware of the oneness of God, believing instead in imaginary gods, as did the ancient Greeks. But such were not their original precepts. Indeed, their original precepts and conduct were entirely different. Again, consider to what an extent the original precepts of the Christian religion have been forgotten, and how many doctrinal innovations have sprung up. For example, Christ forbade violence and revenge, and enjoined instead that evil and injury be met with benevolence and loving kindness. But observe how many bloody wars have taken place among the Christian nations themselves, and how much oppression, cruelty, rapacity, and bloodthirstiness have resulted therefrom. Indeed, many of these wars were carried out at the behest of the popes. It is therefore abundantly clear that with the passage of time, religions are entirely changed and altered, and hence they are renewed. As from some answered questions. So here, while at the beginning it sounds as if, well, the original precepts of the Buddha were actually forgotten, it's immediately paralleled with the loss of the original spirit and the original teachings that were brought by Jesus Christ. It's not speaking of the scriptures themselves. It's saying that one, doctrinal innovations came in, that many of the ethical teachings themselves were actually forgotten, that we began to focus on rituals, and even at times go directly against some of the injunctions of the original message. To such a point where the divine gardener because this tree is no longer bearing fruit, has planted a tree of the same kind within that garden to once again bring fruit to humanity. So this next section is to actually address um, uh, an idea that is very prevalent often within Western Buddhism. Uh, some people refer to it as the indeterminables. It is a real belief um, that the Buddha himself didn't, wasn't interested in, or eschewed, or brushed off discussions about the nature of reality, or what's beyond this world, or the nature of the Buddha himself, or what he's like after death. Um, the most famous one of these is actually a story about an, an arrow, where this individual gets actually shot with a poisoned arrow, and someone comes up to actually pull it out. And the individual says, well, first I want to know like, who, what kind of poison it was, and where the poison came from, and who actually shot it, and what was he like, and what was his character. And the, the Buddha actually, and this is actually in, uh, in the Buddha scriptures, um, says that this is in, in, uh, really folly, because you just actually want the poison out, because it's killing you, right? Um, and this is taken generally to be uh, a presentation that the Buddha had no interest in what was beyond, about different realms of gods and where things came from. Um, but I'm going to actually read a different passage, that's one of the more common ones used. So we're going to look at a quote from the Pali Canon itself on this topic. Or such wanderers might say, does the Tathagata, the Buddha, 
exist after death. Is that true in any other view? Foolish. They should be told, friend, this has not been revealed by the Lord. Does the Tathagata not exist after death? Does he both exist and not exist after death? Does he neither exist nor not exist after death? They should be told, friend, this has not been revealed by the Lord. Then they may say, why is the ascetic Gautama, the Buddha, not revealed this? They should be told, friend, this is not conducive to the welfare or to the Dharma, or to the higher holy life, or to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, tranquility, realization, enlightenment, Nibbana, or Nirvana. That is why the Lord has not revealed it. Or they may say, well, friend, what has the ascetic Gautama revealed? They should be told, this is suffering, has been declared by the Lord. This is the arising of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. This has been declared by the Lord. Then they may say, why has this been declared by the ascetic Gautama? They should be told, friend, this is conducive to welfare, to dharma, to the higher holy life, to perfect disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to realization, to enlightenment, to nibbana. That is why the Lord has revealed it. Kunda, those bases of speculation about the beginnings of things which I have explained to you as they should be explained, should I now explain to you as they should not be explained? And likewise about the future. What are the speculations about the past? There are ascetics and Brahmins who say and believe the self and the world are eternal. This is true and any other view is erroneous. Or the self and the world are not eternal. The self and the world are both eternal and not eternal. The self and the world are neither eternal nor not eternal. The self and the world are self-created. They are created by another. They are both self-created and created by another. They are neither self-created nor created by another, but have arisen by chance, and similarly with regard to pleasure and pain. Now, Kunda, I go to those ascetics and Brahmins who hold any of these views, and if being asked, they confirm that they do hold such views. I do not admit their claims. Why not? Because, Kunda, different beings hold different opinions on such matters. Nor do I consider such theories equal to my own, still less superior. I am their superior in regard to the higher exposition. As for those bases of speculation about the beginning of things which I have explained to you as they should be explained, why should I now explain them to you as they should not be explained? And what about those speculations about the future? Some ascetics and Brahmins who say the self after death is material and healthy, or immaterial, both or neither. The self is conscious after death, unconscious, both or neither. The self perishes, it is destroyed, ceases to be after death. This is true and any other view is erroneous. Now, Kunda, I go to those ascetics and Brahmins who hold any of these views, and if being asked, they confirm that they do hold such views, I do not admit their claims. Why not? Because, Kunda, different beings hold different opinions on such matters. Nor do I consider such theories equal to my own, still less superior. I am their superior in regard to the higher exposition. As for those bases of speculations about the future which I have explained to you as they should be explained, why should I now explain them to you as they should not be explained? And Kunda, for the destruction of all such views about the past and the future, for transcending them, I have taught and laid down the four foundations of mindfulness. What are the four? Here, Kunda, a monk dwells contemplating body as body, ardent, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. He dwells contemplating feelings as feelings, mind as mind. He dwells contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. That is how, Kunda, for the destruction of such views about the past and the future, and for transcending them, I have taught and laid down the four foundations of mindfulness. So here it seems that actually the Buddha is coming out against, on the surface, 
uh, any speculations about the nature of the Tathagata, the Buddha, after death, the nature of the self, where the world came from, um, but rather as giving the, if you will, the noble truths, right, that the life is suffering and that suffering can be ended in the way to end suffering, and giving the four foundations of mindfulness. In addition, uh, there is another problem that we'll see that will come up shortly. But before this, I wanted to read one passage from one common faith, uh, work commissioned by the Universal House of Justice. It is therefore an inadequate recognition of the unique station of Moses, Buddha, Zoroaster, Jesus, and Muhammad, or of the succession of avatars who inspired the Hindu scriptures, to depict their work as the founding of distinct religions. Rather are they appreciated when acknowledged as the spiritual educators of history, as the animating forces in the rise of the civilizations through which consciousness has flowered. He was in the world, the Gospel declares, and the world was made by him. That their persons have been held in a reverence infinitely above those of any other historical figures reflects the attempt to articulate otherwise inexpressible feelings aroused in the hearts of unnumbered millions of people by the blessings their work has conferred. In loving them, humanity has progressively learned what it means to love God. There is, realistically, no other way to do so. They are not honored by fumbling efforts to capture the essential mystery of their nature in dogmas invented by human imagination. What honors them is the soul's unconditioned surrender of its will to the transformative influence they mediate. They are not honored by fumbling efforts to capture the essential mystery of their nature in dogmas invented by human imagination. But what honors them is the soul's unconditioned surrender of its will to the transformative influence they mediate. This is what the Buddha is saying. Right above, he's saying, in the end, you have all these people wrangling within the Brahman class, derived from the thoughts uh, birthed out of the Upanishads. And they're all having these rancorous debates, which he actually mentions, amongst themselves. And he says to them, uh, I have come here for the eradication of suffering. I have come here for the elevation of humanity, for equanimity, for peace, for the development of their transformative will. And he's saying in the end, it is for people to recognize that this is actually the medicine of the divine physician. This is the cultivation of the divine gardener and to embody it in their lives. So we don't disagree on this aspect, which is often called the indeterminables. At the same time, when we actually look at the passage itself, which seems to eschew and push off any of these kinds of speculations, one thing is he actually states that he holds different opinions on such matters. He has a higher exposition, that his conceptions of them are superior. And we're going to see this actually come up in the future because he actually accuses many of these religious teachers of not knowing the true path to the divine because they, in contrast to him, have never been there. So if he's saying his views are a higher exposition, that they are superior, then he has these views. And the problem with taking these kinds of quotes the way they generally are taken is because they make a uh, serious problem for actual Buddhist scripture, because the Buddha does talk about these things. He actually does talk about what it is beyond this domain. He does talk about realms of divinity, about the passage through, if you will, supersensory realms. So we would have to put, to, uh, to assume that this is all he means is just to put aside all these conversations. Those are religious conceptions. We're just here for the you know, upliftment of humanity and a simple philosophical concept would be almost to put on blinders and refuse to look at vast tracts of, of Buddhist scripture itself. There is another aspect of this that we can look at uh, within the context of the Pali Canon. So we'll read it now. From the time Ananda, when a monk no longer regards feeling as the self, or the self as being impercipient, or as being percipient, 
and of a nature to feel. By not so regarding, he clings to nothing in the world. Not clinging, he is not excited by anything. And not being excited, he gains personal liberation. And he knows. Birth is finished. The holy life has been led. Done was what had to be done, and there is nothing more here. And if anyone were to say to a monk whose mind was thus freed, the Tathagata, the Buddha, exists after that, would be seen, seen by him as a wrong opinion, an unfitting. Likewise, the Tathagata does not exist. Both exists and does not exist. Neither exists nor does not exist after death. Why so? As far, Ananda, as designation and the range of designation reaches, as far as language and the range of language reaches, as far as concepts and the range of concepts reaches, as far as understanding and the range of understanding reaches, as far as the cycle reaches and revolves, that monk is liberated from all that by super-knowledge. And to maintain that such a liberated monk does not know and see would be a wrong view and incorrect. Uh, this is a very enigmatic passage, because it sounds like the monk himself, one who has actually achieved his fullest state of liberation in this life, and has achieved nirvana, himself doesn't know the answers to these questions. But at the very end of the passage, he says, to say that the monk does not know and does not see would be a wrong view and incorrect. In the middle is the answer, because it says, as far as language and the range of language reaches, as far as understanding and the range of understanding reaches, that we're dealing with a, a, a worldview where the limits of human language and understanding cannot express the real reality of what the Buddha is after death, or what the real reality of the soul is in the realms beyond. Yet, at the same time, the Buddhist scriptures tell us of them. So what can we gather from this? Uh, this is very much like a, a talk by Abdul Baha and some answer questions, where he talks about intangible, intangible realities, where we cannot describe things that are so lofty and non-physical, so we put them, if you will, into symbol and metaphor and parable. So it's from such symbols and metaphors that we have to gain, if you will, a glimpse of really what is going on within the Buddhist scriptures. And we actually note here in verses 38 and 39 of the passage quoted on determinables, the Buddha says, I do not admit their claims. Why not? Because different beings hold different opinions on such matters, nor do I consider such theories equal to my own, still less superior than his. So he in numerous places explains this reality that is not born of speculation, the speculation of the Brahman or priestly caste. So this contrasts to what the Brahmins themselves are doing, which are, like the passages above, uh, putting invented human dogmas, and in a sense, by their wrangling and debating, are actually losing the original precepts of the religion. Important to this concept uh, is a doctrine within the Buddhist writings that again is often misrepresented in the West. Uh, we often hear that uh, the Buddha himself was just a philosopher who sat down and figured this out. And then he shared what he figured out with the rest of the world. I want to read two quotes quickly from the Buddhist writings, both from the Pali Canon. Sariputta. Sariputta is actually a chief disciple of the Buddha. Sariputta, when I know and see thus, should anyone say of me, the recluse Gautama, the Buddha, does not have any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. The recluse Gautama teaches the Dharma, or Dhamma, merely hammered out by reasoning, following his own line of inquiry as it occurs to him. Unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view, then, as surely as if he had been carried off and put there, he will end up in hell. Just as a bhikkhu, bhikkhu, a priest or monk, possessed of virtue, concentration, and wisdom, would here and now enjoy final knowledge, so it will happen in this case, 
I say that unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view, then, surely as if he had been carried off and put there, he will wind up in hell. The second quote, again addressing Sariputta. Sariputta, when I know and see thus, should anyone say of me, the recluse Gautama does not have any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. The recluse Gautama teaches a dharma hammered out by reasoning, following his own line of inquiry as it occurs to him. Unless he abandons that assertion and state of mind and relinquishes that view, then, as surely as if he had been carried off and put there, he will wind up in hell. It's really the identical quote. Uh, there are many of these within the Buddha scripture, where the Buddha comes out very, very, very clearly and tells his followers in the world that it would be a grievous wrong to say of the Buddha that he had simply philosophically reasoned this out. So much so, again a different topic, that the individual would end up in hell. Uh, another aspect of Buddhism we often don't hear in the West. But here we have that the Buddha, contrary to the perspective as presented by the Brahmin or priestly class of Hinduism, in their speculative reasoning and arguing and debate, the Buddha is saying, no, he is not coming here with a speculative philosophical inquiry. He knows this by direct knowledge, not through the faculty of reason. We see this part clearly because the Buddha says, again to one of his disciples, Again, Udayin, my disciples esteem me for my excellent knowledge and vision thus. When the recluse Gautama says, I know, he truly knows. When he says, I see, he truly sees. The recluse Gautama teaches the Dharma through direct knowledge, not without direct knowledge. He teaches the Dharma with a sound basis, not without a sound basis. He teaches the Dharma in a convincing manner, not in an unconvincing manner. This is the second quality by which my disciples honor me. So does the Buddha understand by hammering out his doctrine by reasoning? No. We're told here that he understands it through direct knowledge. Of course, he says that he teaches it in a convincing manner, that which is hammered out through reasoning to help other people understand it but it's not how he has actually gained the knowledge that he shared. So this next section I called Gods Abound, meaning there are gods everywhere. Um, again, the peculiarity of calling uh, Buddhism a non-theistic religion will really, really come out here. Why? Uh, generally because I don't know of uh, many religions that have any more gods th than Buddhism. If you will, the cosmology, the layers of reality and the divine beings that make it up, is extremely extensive in Buddhism, and oftentimes so extensive it's very difficult to, to keep a, a handle on. We also have several of the passages that you will see within this study where there are divine figures and beings that even the commentators and the translators of these texts don't even know who the Buddha is talking about. So they expand even beyond, uh, if you will, divine beings and realities that we can sort of trace within the Hindu pantheon itself. So here we go. Then the wanderer, Sakuludayan, quieted those wanderers and asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, at what point is an entirely pleasant world realized? Here, Udayan, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu, a monk, enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. He dwells with those deities who have arisen in an entirely pleasant world, and he talks with them, and enters into conversation with them. It is at this point that an entirely pleasant world has been realized. Venerable Sir, Surely it is for the sake of realizing that entirely pleasant world that bhikkhus lead the holy life under the Blessed One. He answers, It is not for the sake of realizing that entirely unpleasant world that the bhikkhus lead the holy life under me. There are other states, Udayin, higher and more sublime than that, and it is for the sake of realizing them 
that bhikkhus lead the holy life under me. We will actually see that there are different realms um, or bases, as they're called within the Hindu cosmology, the realms of reality, uh, called the base of infinite space or, or the base of infinite consciousness that we're going to see. These are often called the jhanas. And the fourth jhana is saying that when an individual has reached this place, he says he dwells with deities, gods, and actually converses with them. And that's an entirely pleasant world in and of itself. Simple point being, there's lots of deities. <laughs> this next quote uh, I called an endless refrain of homage. Um, because this is actually, throughout the Bali Canon, uh, really occurs hundreds of times. It is a declaration of the, or a eulogy of the person of the Buddha. And it reads, Now a good report of Master Gautama has been spread to this effect. That blessed one is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods its Maras and its Brahmas, this generation with its recluses and Brahmins, its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dharma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is to good to see such arahants. In here, the Buddha, and I said this is a, a constant eulogy, a refrain that we hear in sutra after sutra after sutra of the Pali Canon, whenever the beauty of the Blessed One, the Lord Buddha, is actually declared. And it says he is a teacher of gods and humans. He declares this world uh, with gods, maras, and brahmas. These are different classes of divine beings, the Mara itself being of a negative quality, but these are beings that are deities, that are gods. So to say that there is no gods within Buddhism would be a very, very peculiar notion. But he also says in here that he has realized, again with that direct knowledge we just saw, all the realities of this world and the state of it as if a divine physician and himself from that reveals a holy life, perfect and pure for this time. This next quote, I uh, just termed multiple exhaustive God realms <laughs> because we here begin to see really how full the actual Buddhist cosmological picture of divine beings is. And I will apologize from here on forward for my inappropriate uh, pronunciation of Hindu terms or Pali terms. What do you think, Dhananjani? Which is better, hell or the animal realm? The animal realm, Master Sariputta. Which is better, the animal realm or the realm of ghosts? The realm of ghosts, Master Sariputta. Which is better, the realm of ghosts or the realm of human beings? Human beings, Master Sariputta. Which is better, human beings or the gods of the heavens of the four great kings? The gods of the heaven of the four great kings, Master Sariputta. Which is better, the gods of the heaven of the four great kings, or the gods of the heaven of the thirty-three? The gods of the heavens of the thirty-three, Master Sariputta. Which is better, the gods of the heaven of the thirty-three, or the Yama gods? The Yama gods, Master Sariputta. Which is better, the Yama gods or the gods of the Tosita heaven? The gods of the Tusita heaven, Master Sariputta. Which is better? The gods of the Tusita heaven or the gods who delight in creating? The gods who delight in creating, Master Sariputta. Which is better? The gods who delight in creating or the gods who wield power over others' creations? The gods who wield power over others' creations, Master Sariputta. 
What do you think, Dun and Johnny? Which is better, the gods who wield power over others' creations or the Brahma world? Master Sariputta said, the Brahma world. Master Sariputta said, the Brahma world. Then the venerable Sariputta thought, these Brahmins are devoted to the Brahma world. Suppose I show the Brahmin, Dun and Johnny, the path to the company of Brahma. And he said, Dan and Johnny, I shall show you, show you the path to the company of Brahma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, he replied. The venerable Sariputta said this, What is the path to the company of Brahma? Here, Dan and Johnny, a bhikkhu provides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving-kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill-will. This is the path to the company of Brahma. Again, Dhananjani, a bhikkhu abides, pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, with a mind imbued with appreciative joy, a mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second, the third, the fourth, so above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself. He abides, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This too is the path to the company of Brahma. Then Master Sariputta, pay homage in my name with your head at the Blessed One's feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the Brahman Dhananjani is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the feet of the Blessed One. Then the Venerable Sariputta, having established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, rose from his seat and departed. Well, there was still more to be done. Soon after the Venerable Sariputta had left, the Brahman Dhananjani died and reappeared in the Brahma world. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, Sariputta, having established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, rose from his seat and departed, while there was still more to be done. Then the Venerable Sariputta went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said, Venerable Sir, the Brahman Dhananjani is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the Blessed One's feet. Sariputta, having established the Brahman Dhananjani in the inferior Brahma world, why did you rise from your seat and leave while there was still more to be done? Venerable Sir, I thought thus. These Brahmins are devoted to the Brahma world. Suppose I show the Brahman Dhananjani the path to the company of Brahma. Sariputta, the Brahman Dhananjani has died and has reappeared in the Brahma world. So in this quote, uh, Sariputta, which is the chief disciple of the Buddha, is showing a Brahman, uh, a member of the priestly caste of the Hindu faith, the way to Brahma. He knows that he can actually bring him further than the realm of Brahma, but he tells them that he himself can communicate to the Brahman Dhananjani how he can achieve his highest goal, which is union with Brahma in the Brahma world. Hence there is a Brahma, because the Buddha then says the Brahman Dhananjani has had verily appeared in the Brahma world. But also prior to that, we see all of these different gods in ascending order. We had the four great kings, the gods of the 33, the Yama gods, the gods of the Tusita heaven, the gods who delight in creating, the gods who wield power over others' creations, and then the world of Brahma. So in this sense, we actually have an extremely full cosmology, an extremely full pantheon of divine beings, but Sariputta here could have led him higher. He did not teach him everything. But even the path that actually Sariputta gives to the Brahman Dhananjani is about creating with him an all-pervading feeling and consciousness of loving kindness and compassion for everything in the world, 
This again is the Dharma. This is the Dharma that the Buddha has come to actually communicate to humanity. This is what, in order for a person to ascend into Nirvana, they actually have to do. This to at least get past the Brahma world. And so once again, we have this problem of the Dharma being loving kindness. Its laws in this cosmos are loving kindness and compassion. And if we look at the Buddhist ethic, honesty and justice and humility and forgiveness and, and detachment. This next passage uh, relates to the seven stations of consciousness and their devas. This is here where we'll begin to see the bases come in. We're going to have two texts with uh, the bases, which is the highest, most of the highest <laughs> orders of the Buddhist cosmology. And we'll see herein that there are entities in them. It quotes, again, Ananda is one of the chief disciples uh, of the Buddha. Ananda, there are seven stations of consciousness in two realms which are the seven. There are beings different in body and different in perception, such as human beings, some devas, and some in states of woe. That is the first station of consciousness. There are beings different in body and alike in perception, such as the devas of Brahma's retinue, born there on account of having attained the first jhana. That is the second station. There are beings alike in body and different in perception, such as the Abhasara Devas, that is the third station. There are beings alike in body and alike in perception, such as the Subakina Devas, that is the fourth station. There are beings who have completely transcended all perception of matter by vanishing, by the vanishing of the perception of sense reactions, and by non-attention to the perception of variety, thinking Space is infinite. They have attained to the sphere, or the base, of infinite space. That is the fifth station. There are beings who, by transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite, have attained to the sphere of infinite consciousness. That is the sixth station. There are beings who have transcended the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing having attained to the sphere of nothingness. That is the seventh station of consciousness. The two realms are the realm of unconscious beings and secondly, the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. So what we see as enigmatic as some of these structures might seem to those not familiar with Buddhist scripture, what we see is there are all of these realms which come up to these different spheres, the spheres of nothingness, the sphere of, sorry, the sphere of infinite space, the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, and the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. But that within these there are beings, entities that abide within those realms. And remember, these are all above those who have united with Brahma, who have attained the first jhana, the first of these four bases itself. Another quick text on the bases itself. Again, the Buddha speaking to Udayan. Here Udayan, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with a disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. That surmounts it, but that too I say is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it, I say, and what surmounts it? Here Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Perception. That surmounts it.
But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here would I end by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That surrounds it. Thus I speak of the abandoning even of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Do you see, Udayan, any fetters, small or great, of whose abandoning I do not speak? No, venerable sir. That is what the Blessed One said. The venerable Udayan was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So here again we uh, encounter the different bases. The base of infinite space, of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and then again this complete cessation, nirvana. But in each, of these in each of these cases, the individual themselves enters and abides within this realm. These realms which are all above the other realms that we've looked at, and themselves come to be increasingly more imperceptible and difficult to talk about. And this is what the Buddha is actually sharing with, if you will, the Upanishadic world, the Vedantic philosophical world, the Hindu world that he's actually coming to. In each of these realms, he's actually placing as above the Vedic pantheon, above the beings that the average Hindu would actually see as being the realities that they're actually praising and eulogizing, one of which is Brahma. So we see that actually the, if you will, the world of Buddhism is actually highly populated by divine beings. We'll now see actually how every, each and every one of these beings is within the Pali Canon now going to be subordinated to the Buddha himself. Buddha, in essence, is above the gods. Then the spirit of Digga Parajana went to the Blessed One after paying homage to the Blessed One. He stood at one side and said, It is a gain for the Vajans, Venerable Sir, a great gain for the Vajan people, that the Tathagata, the Buddha, accomplished and fully enlightened, dwells among them. And these three clansmen, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Nandiya, and the Venerable Kimbila, on hearing the exclamation of the spirit Diga Paranjana, the earth gods exclaimed, It is a gain for the Vajans, a great gain for the Vajan people, that the Tathagata accomplished and fully enlightened dwells among them. On hearing the exclamation of the earth gods, the gods of the heaven of the four great kings, of the thirty-three, the Yama gods, the gods of Tusi to heaven, the gods who delight in creating, the gods who weed power over others' creation, the gods of Brahma's retinue exclaimed, It is a gain for the Vajans, a great gain for the Vajan people, that the Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened, dwells among them in these three clansmen, the venerable Anuruddha, the venerable Mandiya, the venerable Kimbila. Thus at that instant, at that moment, those venerable ones were known as far as the Brahma world. So here, almost the entire cosmology of the Buddhist world, including the Vedic gods, a point I haven't mentioned, usually it's understood that the gods of the 33 are actually the gods named within the Vedas themselves. These gods, with many other gods above them, are all praising the joy and the honor of the people of the Vajja, this area, the city, because the Buddha and three of his disciples are among them. We again will see another highly populated cosmology, all subordinate to the Buddha. The bhikkhu, the monk, thinks, on that on the, Oh, that on the dissolution of the body after death, I might reappear in the company of the Brahma of a thousand. He fixes his mind on that. This, bhikkhu, is the path, the way that leads to reappearance there. Again, a bhikkhu possesses faith and wisdom. He hears that the Brahma of 2,000, of 3,000, of 4,000, 5,000 is long-lived, beautiful, enjoys great happiness. Now the Brahma of 5,000 worlds abides intent on pervading a world system of 5,000 worlds, and he abides intent on pervading the beings that have reappeared there. 
Just as a man with good sight might take five gall nuts in his hand and review them, so the Brahma of five thousand abides intent on pervading a world system of five thousand worlds, and he abides intent on pervading the beings that have reappeared there, the bhikkhu thinks. Oh, that on the dissolution of the body after death I might reappear in the company of the Brahma of five thousand. He fixes his mind on that. This bhikkhu is the way that leads to reappearance there. Again, a bhikkhu possesses faith and wisdom. He hears that the Brahma of ten thousand is long lived, beautiful, and enjoys great happiness. And he abides intent on pervading a world system of ten thousand worlds, and on pervading the beings that have reappeared there, just as a fine barrel gem of purest water, eight faceted, well cut, lying on a red brocade, glows, radiates, and shines. So the Brahma of ten thousand abides intent on pervading a world system of ten thousand worlds and are pervading the beatings that are appeared there. Again the bhikkhu thinks, Oh, that on the dissolution of the body after death I might reappear in the company of the Brahma of ten thousand. He fixes his mind on that. This bhikkhu is the path, the way that leads to reappearance there. Again the bhikkhu possesses faith and wisdom. He hears that the gods of radiance, the gods of limited radiance, the gods of immeasurable radiance, of streaming radiance, the gods of glory, the gods of limited glory, of immeasurable glory, the gods of refulgent glory, the gods of great fruit, the Aviha gods, the Atapa gods, the Sudasa gods, the Sudasi gods, the Akanita gods, are long lived and beautiful and enjoy great happiness. He thinks, Oh, that on the dissolution of the body, after death, I might reappear in the company of the Akanita gods. He fixes his mind on that. This bhikkhus is the path, that way that leads to reappearance there. He hears that the gods of the base of infinite space, of infinite consciousness, the gods of the base of nothingness, of the base of neither perception nor non-perception are long-lived, long-enduring, and enjoy great happiness. And he thinks, oh, that on the dissolution of the body after death I might reappear in the company of the gods, of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He fixes his mind on that, establishes it, develops it. These aspirations and this abiding of his, thus developed and cultivated, lead to his reappearance there. This bhikkhu is the path, the way that leads to reappearance. Again, a bhikkhu possesses faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and wisdom. He thinks, oh, that by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I might here and now enter upon and abide in a deliverance of mind, and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. And by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, he here and now enters and abides in the deliverance of mind, and the deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of taints. Bhikkhu is this bhikkhu, does not reappear anywhere at all. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted with the Blessed One's words. We again have this extremely filled cosmos. Brahmas of 5,000 worlds or 10,000 worlds. And I actually jumped one section of it that continues to list greater degrees of divine beings. And then continues through another ascending arc to it again reaches the base of infinite space, of infinite consciousness, of nothingness, of neither perception nor non-perception. All of these are the strivings of all entities within the realms of being. And it's only one that actually reaches to the path of nirvana that the Buddha has actually brought, where truly it is the reality of the Buddha that resides, that one can finally be free. But this is above not only the Vedic gods, but of any imaginably known mentioned divine being all subordinate to the reality and truth of the Buddha himself. This here is another longer quote um, from the Bali Canon. Now a number of bhikkhus were sitting in the assembly hall where they had met together and returning from their alms round. After their meal, when this discussion arose among them, it is wonderful, friends, it is marvelous, how mighty and powerful is the Tathagata, again the Buddha, for he is able to know about the Buddhas of the past, who have attained final Nibbana, 
cut the tangle of proliferation, broke the cycle, ended the round, and surmounted all suffering. That for those blessed ones their birth was thus, their names were thus, their clans were thus, their virtue was thus, their state of concentration was thus, their wisdom was thus, their abiding in attainments was thus, their deliverance was thus. When this was said, the venerable Ananda told the bhikkhus, Friend, Tathagatas are wonderful and have wonderful qualities. Tathagatas are marvelous and have marvelous qualities. However, their discussion was interrupted, for the Blessed One rose from meditation. When it was evening, went to the assembly hall and sat down on a seat made ready. Then he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, for what discussion are you sitting together here and now? And what was your discussion that was interrupted? Here, venerable sir, we were sitting in the assembly hall, where we had met together and returning from our arms round, when this discussion arose among us. It is wonderful, friends, it is marvelous. Their deliverance was thus, he continues. When this was said, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda said to us, Friends, Tathagatas are wonderful and have wonderful qualities, marvelous and have marvelous qualities. This was our discussion, Venerable Sir, that was interrupted when the Blessed One arrived. The Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda. That being so, Ananda explained more fully the Tathagatas, wonderful and marvelous qualities. I heard and learned this, Venerable Sir, from the Blessed One's own lips. Mindful and fully aware, Ananda, the Bodhisattva appeared in the Tusita heaven. That mindful and fully aware, the, the Buddha appeared in the Tusita heaven. This I can remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. I heard and learned from the Blessed One's own lips. For the whole of his lifespan, the Bodhisattva remained in the Tujasita heaven. This too I remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. I heard and learned for this from the Blessed One's own lips, mindful and fully aware. The Bodhisattva passed away from the Tujasita heaven and descended into his mother's womb. This too I remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. I heard and learned from the Blessed One's own lips when the Bodhisattva passed away from the Tusita heaven and descended into his mother's womb, then a great immeasurable light, surpassing the splendor of the gods, appeared in the world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmans, with its princes and people. And even in those abysmal world interspaces of vacancy, gloom, and utter darkness, where the moon and the sun, mighty and powerful as they are, cannot make their light prevail, there too a great immeasurable light, surpassing the splendor of the gods, appeared, and the beings born there perceived each other by that light. So other beings indeed have appeared here, they thought. And this ten thousand fold world system shook and quaked and trembled, and there too a great immeasurable light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared. This too I remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. So in this passage we have so many aspects of Buddhism come to the fore that we often don't see within the West. And I think it's important to say that at this point uh, the rumor that uh, the Buddha was agnostic should just be permanently laid to rest. Um, there are endless divine beings, and there are endless divine realms, and some which are so super sensible, inaccessible to the limits of language, because of the limits of language, the limits of human thought, that we can only get a bare sketch of them. Yet in this passage, we actually have the Buddha descending. And he was not born here as a man, but he actually descended from the realms above. In addition to descending from the realms above, his splendor, his radiance, and his light exceeds all the other gods in totality. Not only this, but when he descends into this world, he is born actually immaculately. He is actually born of a virgin birth. In addition to that, when he enters this world, the light of his radiance, the light of Dharma shining out from him, 
fills all of the realms of darkness, the gloomy and abysmal and dark realms, and fills them with light, the place where no other light can reach, so that people can finally see that they're not alone in these realms. We see this again, actually, in further uh, sutras of the Pali Canon, where the Buddha then actually proclaims his message to the world, and the same image is actually used, where the, all the 10,000-fold world systems, all of creation, is filled with light, far beyond that of any of the god denizens of this entire realm. He declares himself to be the best, the foremost among all beings, the highest in the summation of creation, the lord of the Dharma. Um, really, whatever conceptions of divinity that could be found within the Hindu Vedic pantheon, within the philosophical systems of Upanishadic and Brahmanic thought, are here transcended by one figure, the Buddha. This next quote is about a thousands of deities, and they attain to an immaculate vision of the Dharma. Now on that occasion many thousands of deities followed the Blessed One, thinking today the Blessed One will lead the Venerable Rahula further to the destruction of the taints. Then the Blessed One went into the blind men's grove and sat down at the root of a certain tree on a seat made ready. And the Venerable Rahula paid homage to the Buddha, to the Blessed One, and sat down at one side. Then the Blessed One said to the Venerable Rahula, being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands the birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of being. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Rahula was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, while this discourse was being spoken, through not clinging, the Venerable Rahula's mind was liberated from the taints, and in, those, and in those many thousands of deities there arose the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dharma, all that is subject to arising, sub subject to cessation. We find this theme actually arise again in many, many sutras of the Pali Canon, where not only does the radiance of the Buddha actually eclipse the radiance of all these divine beings, but they actually want to know what he has to teach. They come, if you will, unseen by those of us in this world to listen to the proclamation and the exposition of the Dharma to his disciples, and they themselves learn from the Buddha. Another quote. And I, Kavada, have experienced these three miracles by my own super knowledge. Once, Kavada, in this order of monks, the thought occurred to a certain monk. I wonder where the four great elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, cease without remainder. And that monk attained to such a state of mental, mental concentration that the way to the deva realms appeared before him. Then coming to the realm of the devas of the four great kings, he asked those devas, Friends, where do the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air, cease without remainder? At this question, the devas of the four great kings said to him, Monk, we don't know where the four great elements cease without remainder, but the four great kings are loftier and wiser than we are. They may know where the four great elements cease. So that monk went to the four great kings and asked the same question. But they replied, We don't know, but the thirty-three gods may know. So that monk went to the thirty-three gods who said, We don't know, but Saka, the lord of the gods, may know. Uh, this is often, um, Saka is often seen as Indra. Saka, the Lord of the Gods, said, The Yama Devas may know. The Yama Devas said, Suyama, son of the Devas, may know. Suyama said, The Tusita Devas may know. The Tusita Devas said, Santusita, son of the Devas, may know. Santusita said, The, the Nima Narati Devas may know. The, the Nima Narati Devas said, the Sunamita, son of the devas, may know. Sunamita said, The Paranimita Vasavati devas may know. The Paranimita Vasavati devas said, Vasavati, son of the devas, may know. Vasavati said, The devas of Brahma's retinue may know. 
than that monk, by the appropriate concentration made the way to the Brahma world, appear before him. He went to the devas of Brahma's retinue and asked them. They said, We don't know, but there is Brahma, great Brahma, the conqueror, the unconquered, the all-seeing, all-powerful, the lord, the maker and creator, the ruler, appointer and orderer, father of all that have been and shall be. He is loftier and wiser than we are. He would know where the four great elements cease without remainder. And where, friends, is this great Brahma now? Monk, we do not know when, how, and where Brahma will appear. But when the signs are seen, when a light appears and a radiance shines forth, then Brahma will appear. Such signs are an indication that he will appear. Then it was not long before the great Brahma appeared. And that monk went up to him and said, Friend, where do the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air, cease without remainder? To which the great Brahma replied, Monk, I am Brahma, great Brahma, the conqueror, the unconquered, the all-seeing, all-powerful, the lord, the maker and creator, the ruler, appointer and orderer, father of all that have been and shall be. A second time the monk said, Friend, I did not ask if you are Brahma, the great Brahma, etc. I asked you where the four great elements cease without remainder. And a second time the great Brahma replied as before. And a third time the monk said, Friend, I did not ask you that. I asked where the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air, cease without remainder. Then Kivada, the great Brahma, took that monk by the arm, led him aside, and said, Monk, these devas believe there is nothing Brahma does not see. There is nothing he does not know. There is nothing he is unaware of. That is why I did not speak in front of them. But monk, I don't know where the four great elements cease without remainder. And therefore, monk, you have acted wrongly. You have acted incorrectly by going beyond the blessed Lord and going in search of an answer to this question elsewhere. Now, monk, you just go to the blessed Lord and put this question to him, and whatever he answer he gives, accept it. So that monk, as swiftly as a strong man, might flex or unflex his arm, vanished from the Brahma world and appeared in my presence. He prostrated himself before me, then sat down to one side and said, Lord, where do the four great elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element cease without remainder? I replied, Monk, once upon a time, a seafaring merchants, when they set sail on the ocean, took in their ship a land sighting bird. When they could not see the land themselves, they released the bird. The bird flew to the east, to the south, to the west, to the north. It flew to the zenith and to the intermediate points of the compass. If it saw land anywhere, it flew there. But if it saw no land, it returned to the ship. In the same way, monk, you have been as far as the Brahma world, searching for an answer to your question and not finding it. And now you come back to me. But monk, you should not ask your question in this way. Where do the four great elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, cease without remainder? Instead, this is how the question should have been put. Where do earth, water, fire, and air find no footing find? Where are long and short, small and great, fair and foul? Where are name and form wholly destroyed? And the answer is this where consciousness is signless, boundless, all luminous. That's where earth, water, fire, and air find no footing. There, both long and short, small and great, fair and foul, their name and form are wholly destroyed. With the cessation of consciousness, this is all destroyed. So what do we have in this picture? We have a monk who is seeking to understand, where in a sense, materiality, comes to an end, where the experience of body, the experience of spatial dimensions, etc., comes to an end. And in the story, he again ascends through all of these domains, asking and asking each of the denizens of these realms where this comes to an end. Finally, he comes to the realm of Brahma, the highest realm that he can find and think of. And he comes before Brahma, 
and asks him this question. And it's here we get sort of a sense of how uh, difficult Buddhism would have been for a Hindu mind. Why? Because when the monk asks Brahma, which we've seen many of the Brahmins are trying to attain this world, which the Buddha already puts worlds and worlds and worlds beyond, and says basically that he himself is infinitely superior to Brahman, Brahma. Brahma then actually answers that he knows everything, is all seeing, has created everything. And the monk four times asks him the same question. Brahman then kind of tucks him away over to the side and confides in him that he doesn't know that he wanted to save face in front of his retinue, and that the monk had made a horrible mistake because he left the company of the Buddha, when of course the Buddha knows what he does not. So the apex of a Hindu cosmology, because we've already passed Saka, who is Indra, we've passed the 33 gods, which would be like Varuna, Agni, Vayu, all these divine beings, we have surmounted all of them, and Buddhism puts this one figure, Brahma the Creator, at the pinnacle, and says even he can actually himself have an ego, and can actually, in order to save face, hide his ignorance from his followers. And he knows that there is a being in this domain of all the world systems of reality who is his superior, who knows what he does not know. And that is the Buddha. We have to note that as extremely populated and seemingly polytheistic that Buddhism is, and Hinduism itself seems to be on the surface, immediately we can actually see that there is a hierarchy. And in some sense, for the Western mind, these are more angelic entities, beings who inhabit realms or worlds beyond this one. But even they actually have a hierarchy that seems to slowly come to a point. That in reality, we to this point, we see there is one entity that actually stands above them all, and that is the king of the Dharma, the Buddha. This is why, as well, that we see, as I mentioned, that Buddhism could have been so difficult for a Hindu mind, because it seems to have actually de-elevated, if you will, lowered the rank and standing of their divine beings by placing the Buddha above. Uh, we see similar themes in actually Christianity's relationship to Judaism or Islam to Christianity, where on the surface it seems to have reduced. We will see, however, because we're going to look at some Hindu texts, that I believe very much that the Buddha is actually making a claim to what he is that a Hindu from their own scriptures could fully understand. Another quote. And he asked the Lord about this. Ananda, the devas from the ten world spheres have gathered to see the Tathagata. For a distance of twelve yajanas, around the Malasal grove, near Kusinara, there is not a space you could touch with the point of a hair that is not filled with mighty devas. And they are grumbling. We have come a long way to see the Tathagata. It is rare for a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, to arise in the world. And tonight, in the last watch, the Tathagata will attain final Nibbana. And this mighty monk is standing in front of the Lord, preventing us from getting a last glimpse of the Tathagata. But Lord, what kind of devas can the Lord perceive? Ananda, there are sky devas whose minds are earthbound. They are weeping and tearing their hair, raising their arms, throwing themselves down, and twisting and turning, crying, All too soon the blessed Lord is passing away. All too soon the welfarer is passing away. All too soon the eye of the world is disappearing. And there are earth devas whose minds are earthbound who do likewise. But those devas who are free from craving endure patiently, saying, All compounded things are impermanent. What is the use of this? In this story, from the Mahaparinibbana Sutra, is actually just before the Buddha dies, before he leaves his earthly frame. 
and we see that the entire domain, anything you could possibly see, from the vision of the Buddha, is jam-packed with divine beings, all coming to, just to actually capture a glimpse of the Buddha. Some of them, with lesser understanding, are actually tearing their clothes, throwing themselves along the ground, crying and moaning and groaning, just because they want to see the Buddha before he leaves the world systems where all the elements abide. Because he is released here in this, in this sutra itself, he will be released from his dispensation within this world. And all of these are actually just trying to see the Lord before he actually leaves. Again, all of the divine beings below the Buddha. So I'm here going to read a quite long passage. And um, this passage shows that really all divine beings, including all of the Vedic entities, themselves adore the Buddha, worship the Buddha, praise the Buddha and come to see him. And there are many entities in here, as I've uh, alluded to previously, that actually we, we've never even heard of. We don't even know who they are. The, the general gist being that all of the divine realm, all of the world systems come to praise the Buddha. Thus I have heard, once the Lord was staying among the Sakyans in the great forest, Hakapilevatu, with a large company of some 500 monks, all Arahans. And devas from ten world systems frequently came there to visit the Lord and his order of monks. And it occurred to four devas of the pure abodes, the Blessed One is staying at Kapalavatu with a large company of some five hundred monks, all arhans. These are ones who have attained liberation. What if we were to approach him and each recite a verse? Then those devas, as swiftly as a strong man might stretch his flexed arm or flex it again, vanished from the pure abodes and appeared before the Lord. They saluted him, stood to one side, and one of them recited this verse. Great the assembly in the forest, here the devas have met, and we are here to see the unconquered brotherhood. Another said, the monks with concentrated minds are straight. They guard their senses as the driver does his reins. Another said, bars and barriers broken, the threshold stone of lust torn up, unstained the spotless seers go like well-trained elephants. And another said, who takes refuge in the Buddha? No downward path will go. Having left the body, he'll join the deva hosts. Then the Lord said to his monks, Monks, it has often happened that the devas from the ten world systems have come to see the Tathagata and his order of monks. So it has been with the supreme Buddhas of the past, and so it will be with those of the future, as it is with me now. I will detail for you the names of the groups of devas, announce them and teach them to you. Pay close attention and I will speak. Yes, Lord, said the monks. And the Lord said, I'll tell you them in verse to which realm each belongs, but those who dwell composed and resolute, like lions in mountain caves, have overcome hair-raising fear and dread, their minds white, pure, unstained, and calm. In Kapalavatu's wood the Lord perceived five hundred of his arhats and more, lovers of his word. To them he said, Monks, observe the Deva host approach, and the monks strove eagerly to see. With superhuman vision thus arising, some saw a hundred gods, a thousand some, while some saw seventy thousand, others saw gods innumerable all around. And he who knows with insight was aware of all that they could see and understand. And to the lovers of his word, the Lord turning said, the Devahos approach, look and seek to know them, monks in turn, as I declare their names to you in verse. 7,000 yakas of Kapila's realm, well endowed with power and mighty skills, fair to see with splendid train, have come rejoicing to this wood to see such monks. And 6,000 yakas from Himalaya, a varied hue and well endowed with powers, fair to see with splendid train, have come rejoicing to this wood to see such monks. 
from Sata's mount, three thousand yakas more of varied hue. The sum is sixteen thousand yakas all of varied hue. Of Vesamita's host, five hundred more of varied hue. Kumbira, too, from Rajagaha comes, whose dwelling place is on Vapula's slopes. A hundred thousand yakas follow him. King Datarata, ruler of the east, the Gandaba's lord, a mighty king, has come with retinue. Many sons are his, who all bear Indra's name, all well endowed with mighty skills. King Varulha, ruler of the south, the Kumbanda's lord, a mighty king, Virupaka, ruler of the west, the lord of Nagas, and a mighty king. King Guvera, ruler of the north, lord of Yakas, and a mighty king. From the east, King Tatarata shone. From the south, Virulhaka. And from the west, Virupaka Kuvera from the north. Thus ranged in Kapalavatu's wood, the four great kings in all their splendor stood. With them came their vassals versed in guile, skilled deceivers all. Kuten, Kutendu first, then Vatendu, Vitu, Vituka, Kandana, Kamaseta next. Kinugandu, Nigandu, these Panada Opamana Matali, who was the Deva's charioteer, Nala, Kitasena of the Gandabas, Raja, Janisaba, Pakansika, Timbaru, and Surya Vakasa, his daughter, these and more rejoicing came to that wood to see the Buddha's monks. From Nabasa Vasali, Tachaka, came Nagas, Kambalas, Asataras, Payagas with their kin. From Yamuna, Tatarata came with splendid host. Eravana too, the mighty Naga chief, to the forest meeting place has come, and the twice-born winged and clear of sight. Fierce Garuda birds, the Naga's foes have come, flying here, Sitra and Supana. But here the Naga kings are safe. The Lord has imposed a truce. With gentle speech, they and the Nagas share the Buddha's peace. Asuras, too, whom Indra's hand once struck, ocean dwellers now in magic skilled, Vasava's resplendent brothers came, Kalakanjas, terrible to see, Danavegasas, Vipasiti, Susiti, Paharada, too, Felnamuki, and Bali's hundred sons, who were called Viroka, with a band of warriors who joined their master Rahu, who had come to wish their meeting well. Gods of water, earth, and fire, and wind, the Varunas and their retainers, Soma and Yasa too, devas born of love and compassion. With a splendid train, these ten with tenfold varied hosts, endowed with mighty powers and fair to see, rejoicing came to see the Buddha's monks. And Venhu, or Vishnu. Two with his Sahalis came, the Asamas, the Yama twins, and those Devas who tend on moon and sun, constellation gods, sprites of clouds. Saka, the Vasu's lord, ancient giver, these ten with tenfold varied hosts. The Sahabus, radiant bright, came next, fiery crested, the Aritakas, the Rojas, cornflower blue with Varuna, Sahadama, Akuta, and Anejaka, Suleha, Rukira, Vasana, Vasavanesis, these ten with tenfold various hosts. The Samanas and Mahasamanas both, being manlike and more than manlike, came. The pleasure corrupted, the mind corrupted gods, green devas and the red ones too. Paragas, Mahaparagas, with train, these ten with tenfold varied hosts. Sukas, Karumhas, Arunas, Viganasas, followed in Otadagaya's wake. Vikakanas, Sadamatas, Haragajas, those gods called mixed in splendor, and Pajuna the thunderer, who also causes rains, these ten with tenfold varied hosts. The Kamiyas, the Tusitas, the Yamas, the Katahakas with train, the Lambitakas, the Lama chiefs, and the gods of flame, the Asavas, those who delight in shapes. They've made 
and those who seize on others' works. These ten with tenfold varied hosts. These sixty deva hosts of varied kinds all came arranged in order of their groups, and others too in due array, they said, He whose transcended birth, he for whom no obstacle remains, who's crossed the flood, him cankerless will see, the mighty one traversing free without transgression, as it were the moon that passes through the clouds. Subrahma next, and with him Paramata, Sanankumara, Tisa, who are sons of the mighty ones. These also came. Maha Brahma, who ruled a thousand worlds and the Brahma world supreme, arisen there, shining bright and terrible to see, with all his train, ten lords of his who each rule the Brahma world, and in their midst, Harita, who ruled a hundred thousand. And when all these had come in vast array with Indra and the hosts of Brahma too, then too came Mara's hosts, and now observe that black one's folly. For he said, Come on, seize and bind them all, with lust will catch them all, surround them all about, let none escape, whoever he may be. Thus the warlord urged his murky troops, with his palm he shook the ground, and made a horrid din, as when a storm cloud bursts with thunder, lightning, and with heavy rain. And then shrank back, enraged but powerless. And he who knows by insight saw all this and grasped its meaning. To his monks he said, The hosts of Mara come, monks, pay good heed. They heard the Buddha's words and stayed alert, and Mara's host drew back from those on whom neither lust nor fear could gain a hold. Victorious transcending fear, they've won. His followers rejoice with all the world. So in part, I apologize for the length of this quote. Um, it's a very long part of a Buddhist sutra. The mighty gathering, it's called. I chose it specifically because it so profoundly illustrates how the Pali Canon, the most ancient Buddhist scriptures we know, represent the reality and the nature of the Buddha. In this mighty gathering, every god comes. Even those beings that actually mythical beings who fight under the Buddha's words obtain a peace. Warring factions come and they're united in their loving adoration of the Buddha. In this pantheon, we see Brahma, Vishnu, Vayu, Indra. <laughs> we see the main chief Vedic gods and beings far surpassing them, all coming to the Buddha just so they get to see him. Because his appearance, or if you will, the light that appears in the lamp that he is at this time, comes so rarely to the world that it is the great joy and ultimate joy of any of these beings to be present when the Buddha is here. We also see nearing the end of the story that actually Mara, if you will, clearly the Buddhist Satan, comes rushing forth with all his armies to actually conquer because he's got all the divine beings, all of reality that have come here to see the Buddha, and if you noted multiple times, even just to get to see his monks, the ones who have actually truly embodied his teachings. They even want to see just them. Mara rushes forward to conquer them with ego, with lust and pride, but is suddenly thwarted as he's coming up. By who? By the light of the Buddha. They are protected by the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, really in essence who the Buddha is. There is, I think, if we really look at this quote, and again many other quotes within the Pali Canon, there is one supreme ruler of all of the cosmos in any way, shape, or form that we could ever know, and it's the Buddha. 
there is a question as to what the Buddha is. I do want to read one quote here. Ananda, these eight kinds of assemblies, what are they? They are the assembly of the Katidyas, the assembly of Brahmins, the assembly of householders, the assembly of ascetics, the assembly of devas of the realm of the four great kings, the assembly of the thirty-three gods, the assembly of Maras, the assembly of Brahmas. I remember well, Ananda, many hundreds of assemblies of Katyas that I have attended. And before I sat down with them, spoke to them, or joined in their conversation, I adopted their appearance and speech, whatever it might be. And I instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted them with a discourse on Dharma. And as I spoke with them, they did not know me and wondered, Who is it that speaks like this? A deva or a man? And having thus instructed them, I disappeared, and still they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he a deva or a man? I remember well many hundreds of assemblies of Brahmins, of householders, of ascetics, of devas of the realm of the four great kings, of the thirty-three gods, of Maras, of Brahmas, and still they did not know. He who has just appeared, was he a deva or a man? Those Ananda are the eight assemblies. In this passage, the Buddha clearly states that when he has actually appeared in any of the realms of creation, all the way up to the realm of Brahma's retinue, and any of the domains of these world systems, he appears as if he is one of the denizens of that domain, so that they don't know if he is one like them, a man, or a deva above them. Because even in the case of him being in the realm of Brahma, they're asking, is he a man or a deva? From their frame of reference being, is this figure one of us, or is he is something beyond? And in the case uh, that we're seeing here, in each case, he is revealing to them truth. He is obviously their superior. Buddha is Dharma, the deathless, the all-knowing. The Venerable Maha Kasana replied, Friends, it is though a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, after he had passed over the root and the trunk. And so it is with you, Venerable Sirs, that you think that I should be asked about the meaning of this, after you pass the Blessed One by, when you are face to face with the teacher. For knowing, the Blessed One knows. Seeing, he sees. He is vision. He is knowledge. He is the Dharma. He is the Holy One. He is the Sayer, the Proclaimer, the Elucidator of Meaning, the Giver of the Deathless, the Lord of the Dharma the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you, so you should have remembered it. This quote is saying very clearly, the Buddha is not just revealing the Dharma. He is the Dharma. He is the door to the deathless, a refrain we find within the Pali scriptures. That it is his very self that is actually revealing that deathless reality that ever-abiding, ever-living entity that actually is beyond, that it is in the approach towards that we actually reach nirvana. That he is said to be the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of all meaning. In essence, the Buddha is the Dharma. He is the word. He is the expression of truth, the voicing of the the deathless, the ever-abiding one. He is really and truly the Word made flesh that we see in the beginning of the Gospel of John. Even the previous quote where we're actually looking at the question of whether he was a deva or a man, even in the highest of realms, it is like within the Quran where it says, where we were to have sent you an angel, we would have made him appear as a man. 
this concept that the divine being, the deathless, the ever-abiding, the dharma, the truth, is that which reveals itself unto humankind in the forms of the beings that he comes to, while his form is itself an embodiment of their form. So they can have this question of, is he one of us or is he something much greater? Is the vehicle of the dharma, thus he is the king of the dharma. So a further quote. Then bhikkhus, or monks, when I stayed at Uruvela, as long as I chose, I set out to wander by stages to Benares, between Gaya and the place of enlightenment. The Ajivaka Upaka saw me on the road and said, Friend, your faculties are clear. The color of your skin is pure and bright. Under whom have you gone forth, friend? Who is your teacher? Whose dharma do you profess? I replied to Ajivaka Upaka in stanzas. I am the one who has transcended all, the knower of all, unsullied among all things, renouncing all, my cravings ceasing freed. Having known this all for myself, to whom should I point as teacher? I have no teacher, and one like me exists nowhere in all the worlds with all its gods because I have no person for my counterpart. I am the accomplished one in the world. I am the teacher supreme. I am lone am a fully enlightened one whose fires are quenched and extinguished. I go now to the city of Kasi to set in motion the wheel of Dharma. In a world that has become blind, I go to beat the drum of the deathless. The Buddha here is saying he is the knower of all, the one that is truly pure that no one like him exists in all of the worlds with all of his gods, that he has no person who is his counterpart, was not taught by anyone, and that he is the teacher supreme who goes to beat the drum of the deathless again. Um, once again, reading this, we see that the Buddha is explicitly placing himself above all other entities, that he is the pinnacle of creation, and that there is no one else like him and no other teacher that can truly teach. And this demonstrates once again the station that the Buddha is claiming, as well, of, as well as, if you will, the exclusivist nature of Buddhism, which we will look at in another video. Or such wanderers might say, as regards past times, the ascetic Gautama, the Buddha, displays boundless knowledge and insight, but not about the future as to what it will be and how it will be. That would be to suppose that knowledge and insight about one thing are to be produced by knowledge and insight about something else, as fools imagine. As regards the past, the Tathagata has knowledge of past lives. He can remember as far back as he wishes. As for the future, this knowledge born of enlightenment and rises in him. This is the last birth. There will be no more becoming. If the past refers to what is not factual, to fables, to what is not of advantage, the Tathagata makes no reply. If it refers to what is factual, not fabulous, but which is not of advantage, the Tathagata makes no reply. But if the past refers to what is factual, not fabulous, and which is of advantage, then the Tathagata knows the right time to reply. The same applies to the future and the present. Therefore, Kunda, the Tathagata, is called the one who declares the time, the fact, the advantage, the Dharma, and the discipline. This is why he is called Tathagata. Kunda, whatever in this world, with its devas, maras, and brahmas, with its ascetics and brahmins, its princes and people, is seen by people, heard, cognized, whatever was ever achieved, sought after, or mentally pondered on, all that has been fully understood by the Tathagata. That is why he is called the Tathagata. Between the night in which the Tathagata gains supreme enlightenment, Kunda, and the night in which he attains the Nibbana element without remainder, whatever he proclaims, says or explains, is so and not otherwise. That is why he is called Tathagata. And of this world, with its devas and maras, brahmas, with its ascetics and brahmins, its princes and people, the Tathagata is the unvanquished conqueror, the seer and ruler of all. That is why he is called Tathagata. So the Buddha here is saying that all things of the past, all things that are factual, all things that are advantageous to humanity, all things 
that are virtuous, he actually has full awareness of, and that he himself, above all devas, all maras, all entities, he actually stands at the gen, at the, at the very pinnacle of this. We also see as well that he's saying that he is the ruler of all, and the seer and knower of all that is. Basically a principle of ultimate sovereignty, of ultimate power, and omniscient, able to know all things that are factual, all related to the good, the true, and the beautiful. And again the same refrain. For knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dharma, he is the Holy One. He is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the lord of the dharma, the tathagata. Bhikkhus, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he has attained mastery and perfection in noble virtue, attained mastery and perfection in noble concentration, attained mastery and perfection in noble wisdom, attained mastery and perfection in noble deliverance. It is of Sariputta, indeed, that rightly speaking, this should be said. Bhikkhus, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he is the son of the Blessed One, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dharma, created by the Dharma, an heir in the Dharma, not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking, this should be said. Because the matchless wheel of the Dharma, set rolling by the Tathagata, is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. Uh, Sariputta is actually the chief disciple of the Buddha. And here the Buddha is actually extolling Sariputta. But what does he tell us about the nature of Sariputta and his relationship to the Buddha? We hear that he is the son of the Buddha, obviously not the physical son. That he is born of his mouth and born of his dharma, created by the dharma. That the reality that really truly is Sariputta is coming from the, the Buddha himself. That it's the dharma that has given birth to Sariputta, and the dharma we've just recently seen is actually equated identically with the Buddha himself. He is the dharma, he is knowledge, and he is a child of the Buddha. Again, a conception very, very close to notions that we actually see within the New Testament. He is born of the Word, right, himself. That this being that we're seeing within the Buddhist scriptures is so extremely distant from the notion of just being a philosopher or someone who hammered out by reason the realities of truth. This is a being that stands superior to all of the devas, brahmas, and any radiant being that can be seen within reality. This figure, Sariputta, within the Pali Canon is very reminiscent of Abdu'l-Baha, one who is the full reflection and the full expression of the law of the Buddha himself, of his Dharma. Just as we know that Abdu'l-Baha is the perfect exemplar and is really, quote, born out of the ocean of pre-existence, begotten by Baha or Baha'u'llah. Vasetta, all of you, though of different birth, name, clan, and family, who have gone forth from the household life into homelessness, if you are asked who you are, should reply, we are ascetics, followers of the Sakyan, that is the Buddha. He whose faith in the Tathagata is settled, rooted, established, solid, unshakable by any ascetic or Brahman, any Deva or Mara or Brahma, or anyone in the world, can truly say, I am a true son of the Blessed Lord, born of his mouth, born of Dharma, created by Dharma, an heir of Dharma. Why is that? Because, Vasetta, this designates the Dharma. The body of Dharma, that is, the body of Brahma, or become Dharma, that is, become Brahma. So just as Sariputta, as the one who will inherit the Dharma and guide the community, in a different way, all those who have actually followed, right, all those that have actually followed the Dharma, the law, and the teachings of the Buddha, can claim to be his true sons that they have been 
born, or if you will, born again, through the Dharma, and in essence are created by the Dharma, that they themselves can say this. Why? Because the Buddha is actually saying here, because the Tathagata, the Buddha himself, is the body of the Dharma. He is the body of Brahma here, it says. And even within the Pali notes, it's stated that this is being presented because he is the highest that anything in creation can encounter, not Brahma of the of the, say the, the Vedic scriptures or the pantheon itself, but rather he himself is the greatest embodiment of what someone sees within the concept of Brahma. Um, this term, the, the, the body of the Dharma, uh, actually again within the notes within the Pali Canon, is referencing a concept of the Trikaya doctrine, the three bodies of the Buddha, where the Buddha himself, what we see here on earth is his uh, physical form, or his Rupakaya, his, his, literally his material body. But that being that we know of as in the Buddha actually has a celestial body, which is itself, if you will, the lamp that carries the light of the Dharma, the Dharmakaya, or the body of the Dharma. The concept of the Buddha within the Pali scriptures and the Mahayana, Mahayana scriptures is represented as a being who comes, if you will, in the station of servant, of messenger, and of, if you will, the word, the logos, or the concept of Lahut, the true manifestation of God. This concept sounds, when one really begins to look at it, identical to what you would read within the New Testament, and is actually referenced within the Baha'i writings on the different voices of the manifestation of God. Another quote. When this was said, King Avantiputta of Madura said to the venerable Maha Kasana, Magnificent, Master Kasana, magnificent. Master Kasana has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Kasana for refuge, and to the Dharma and the Sangha of the, Buka, of the Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Kasana remember me as a lay follower, who has gone to him for refuge for life. He replies, Do not go to me for refuge, great king. Go to refuge to that same blessed one to whom I have gone for refuge. Where is he living now, that blessed one? accomplished and fully enlightened, Master Kasana. He answers, That blessed one, accomplished and fully enlightened, has attained to final Nibbana, great king. If we heard that blessed one was within ten leagues, we would go ten leagues in order to see that blessed one, accomplished and fully enlightened. If we heard that the blessed one was within twenty leagues, thirty leagues, forty leagues, fifty leagues, a hundred leagues, we would go to a hundred leagues in order to see that blessed one, accomplished and fully enlightened. But since that blessed one has attained to final Nibbana, we go to that blessed one for refuge, and to the Dharma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today let Master Kasana remember ye as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Here we have represented uh, an individual who is saying that we must be willing to travel the expanse of the earth to actually find the blessed Buddha himself. And since he is in Nirvana, or Nibbana in the Pali scriptures, that he is willing to travel all the way through all the realms of God, all the way through the four great kings, the, the gods of the 33, the Yama gods, all the way up through these hierarchies to actually find the Buddha himself. And he's expressing that in this world as taking refuge in that celestial Buddha. This figure, which contrary to what many people will often say, who is still the refuge and still the goal of the follower themselves, even though he is in Nirvana. So at this time we're actually going to move um, into some of the Upanishads, which are part of the Hindu scriptures. Uh, the reason why is because I want to look with you at some texts from the Upanishads to see what was the cultural milieu in which the Buddha was speaking, and see how that actually relates uh, to what the Buddha is saying in all of the quotes that we've seen above, and then take stock of how they relate to each other. 
So this first quote is actually from the Kena Upanishad. Uh, the Upanishads, a section of Hindu scripture that are um, highly philosophical in some cases, but exquisitely beautiful. The teacher says, If thou thinkest I know it well, then thou knowest surely but little. What is that form of Brahman known? It may be to thee. The pupil says, I do not think I know it well, nor do I know that I do not know it. He among us who knows this, he knows it. Nor does he know that he does not know it. He by whom it, Brahman, is not thought, by him it is thought. He by whom it is thought, knows it not. It is not understood by those who understand it. It is by understood by those who do not understand it. It is thought to be known as if by awakening, and then we obtain immortality indeed. By the self we obtain strength, by knowledge we obtain immortality. If a man knows this here, that is the true end of life. If he does not know this here, then there is great destruction in new births. The wise who have thought on all things and recognize the self in them become immortal when they have departed from this world. Um, though enigmatic, um, this should make sense if we actually look at Buddhist scripture as well as Baha'i scripture. That really when it comes to truly describing or truly understanding the reality of God or the divine beings, that we have reached a limit, the limits of knowledge, the limits of understanding. So there's an aspect where an individual has to admit that they cannot possibly describe this accurately. And uh, here at the beginning of this Upanishad it's saying it is only by recognizing the limits of our own knowledge that we can come to truly know what it is. This sounds very Buddhist because so much, uh, <laughs> so many of the Buddhist scriptures when they try to talk about Nirvana or the Dharma or even the Buddha, they express that we are crashing against the limits of language and the limits of our own understanding. At the same time, uh, we will read the Upanishad, it continues. Brahman obtain the victory for the Devas. The Devas became elated by the victory of Brahman, and they thought, this victory is ours only, this greatness is ours only. Brahman perceived this and appeared to them, but they did not know it, and said, what sprite, yaksha or yaksha, is this? They said to Agni, fire, O Gatavedas, find out what that being is, or that sprite is. Yes, he said. He ran toward it, and Brahman said to him, Who are you? He replied, I am Agni, I am Gatavedas. Brahman said, What power is in you? Agni replied, I could burn all whatever there is on earth. Brahman put a straw before him, saying, burn this. He went towards it with all his might, but he could not burn it. Then he returned thence and said, I could not find out what sprite this is. So in this story, the gods, here we've met Agni, one of the gods of the Vedas, of the traditional scriptures of, of Hinduism, they actually believe that they have obtained some victory. But it was actually Brahman that obtained the victory. Now what happens is, is Brahman appears to these gods, and the god of fire from the Vedas, Agni, actually approaches Brahman because they want to know who this figure is, because they can't actually understand who this figure is. In the story, Brahman puts down a, asks him who he is. Uh, Agni says, I am the god of fire, what power do you have? I can burn away all things. And he puts a straw down and says, well then burn this. But Agni is suddenly impotent in front of Brahman, and he rushes back and tells the other gods, I have no idea what that being is. Okay? And this theme is going to repeat several times. Then they, the gods, said to Vayu, Er, O oh, Vayu, find out what sprite this is. Yes, he said. He ran toward it, and Brahman said to him, Who are you? He replied, I am Vayu, I am Matarisvan. Brahman said, 
what power is in you? Vayu replied, I could take up all whatever there is on earth. Brahman put a straw before him, saying, Take it up. He, Vayu, went towards it with all his might, but he could not take it up. Then he returned thence and said, I cannot find out what sprite this is. Then they said to Indra, O Magavan, find out what sprite this is. He went towards it, but it disappeared from before him. Then in the same space, he came towards a woman, highly adorned. It was Uma, the daughter of Himavat. He said to her, Who is that sprite? She replied, It is Brahman. It is through the victory of Brahman that you have thus become great. After that, he knew it, that it was Brahman. Therefore, these devas, Agni, Vayu, and Indra, are, as it were, above the other gods, for they touched it, Brahman, nearest. And therefore Indra is, as it were, above the other gods, for he touched it nearest, he first knew it. They're trying to figure out what this being is. This being we know to be Brahman, uh, who is behind the victory they believed they had achieved. Uh, many things come out of this passage. One, we see that, contrary to what many people might say, Brahman is a personal entity. This is a being that can manifest in this world. And when he manifests here, these gods of Hinduism don't actually know who this figure is. They can't really figure him out. That's why they each approach in turn. But when they each approach in turn, they are completely impotent, even in their own domain of power. It's really that we know that there is a personal figure, or personal manifestation of Brahman that can appear to beings generally, and that this figure is the ultimate reality manifested within this plane. Basically, when someone actually looks at the Pali Canon from within the perspective of the Upanishadic and Vedic thought, we see the Buddha himself claiming to be something the giver of the Dharma, the lord of the Dharma, he who is the gate to the deathless, the one who knows all, who sees all, and then that figure, the Buddha, is actually placed above and beyond every known Vedic god. But he himself speaks and talks and teaches all the divine beings. And I think very strongly, when we actually look at the Kenya Upanishad, and see this figure who manifests to the gods, who they don't know who this figure is, we see the figure of the Buddha. And the Buddha himself, if we look at the Kenya Upanishad, and then we look at how the Buddha represents himself, these figures are one. So that if someone was to be, which many would have been, familiar with the Kenya Upanishad, that Brahman himself can manifest personally and is above all the gods, they could have heard, if you will, the echo of this claim within the claim of the Buddha. Even the fact that they don't know who Brahman is here, we just recently read a passage where we hear that the Buddha, when he appears to the great assemblies, be it Maras or Brahmas or Yama gods or the gods of the 33, he actually appears in such a way that those beings in whatever tier of existence they are, actually when he leaves, don't know if he is what? A deva, or one like them. One ascendant, or one equal unto them. This is actually what the Buddha says within the Pali Canon. Uh, in the previous passage from the Pali Canon, there was a very, it's the longest passage we've looked at, was a very long list of divine beings. Right? And at the end of that list, what occurs? Mara, the evil one, approaches this grand assembly of all of the gods who have come to witness the passing away of the Buddha, and it's actually the Buddha that prevents Mara from destroying them. He gained or obtained a victory for the gods, 
but the only ones that really see this are the true disciples of the Buddha at the end of that passage. Once again this should ring very clear to someone who is familiar with the Kena Upanishad, because that's how the story of Brahman begins. For our own self, just as a quick throw out there, um, it's interesting as well that when Indra rushes towards Brahman, he actually disappears, and in his place is suddenly a divine female, the Maid of Heaven. The next, uh, the next passage is from the Kata Upanishad, and is about a figure called the Purusha. This is that eternal Asvata tree, with its roots above and branches below. That root indeed is called the Bright. That is Brahman, and that alone is the immortal. In that all worlds are contained, and none can pass beyond. This verily is that. Whatever there is, the whole universe vibrates because it has gone forth from Brahman, which exists as its ground. That Brahman is a great terror, like a poised thunderbolt. Those who know it become immortal. In this passage, just to pause for a moment, we see at the beginning the Asvata tree, this ultimate tree in which all the worlds hang, and it itself is called the Bright, or in other translations, the Glory. It is, if you will, for the Baha'is, a, the Sadratul Mantaha, the image of the manifestation of God. The whole universe itself is some, in some sense contained within it and vibrates and resonates with what has come forth from Brahman. The quote continues. From terror of Brahman fire burns, from terror of it the sun shines, from terror of it Indra and Vayu and death the fifth run. So not only are we seeing that that alone is the one, that alone is the immortal, that Indra and Vayu flee from this divine being, that Brahman, but also we see the notion that death itself flees from Brahman, this actual divine tree, this cosmic tree that is the true one. Um, and once again, if we look at the Buddhist scriptures that we've been passing through over and over again, we're told that the Buddha himself is the door to the deathless, to immortality, from the cessation of all clinging. Beyond the senses is the mind. Beyond the mind is the intellect. Higher than the intellect is the great Atman. Higher than the great Atman is the unmanifest. Beyond the unmanifest is the person, all, pervading and imperceptible. Having realized him, the embodied self becomes liberated and attains immortality. His form is not an object of vision, no one beholds him with the eye. One can know him when he is revealed by the intellect free from doubt and by constant meditation. Those who know this become immortal. So beyond all the aspects of the human being, uh, the, bo the body, the mind, the intellect, and even the great Atman, is actually this unmanifest. There's some unmanifest nature. But even beyond that is the person, the Purusha, which is a really a personality. It is not actually just an immaterial sort of you know abstract concept, as we saw within the Kenya Upanishad, because this being can actually appear in our world and appear to gods. But we also have it that no one can actually truly see this figure, no one can truly know him except when he is revealed through meditation and, as we will see, prayer. Again, this is much like what the Pali Canon is saying about the ineffability, the, in the inability to actually truly describe the Dharma, but that it can actually become personal in the sense of the Dharma Kaya, the body of the Dharma embodying here in the person of the Buddha. This is the final quote from the Upanishads. Uh, it's from the Mundaka Upanishad. There the stainless and indivisible Brahman shines in the highest golden sheath. It is pure, it is the light of lights. It is that which they know who knows the self. The sun does not shine there, nor the moon and the stars, nor these lightnings, not to speak of this fire. 
When he shines, everything shines after him. By his light, everything is lighted. That immortal Brahman alone is before, that Brahman is behind, that Brahman is to the right and left, Brahman alone pervades everything above and below. This universe is that supreme Brahman alone. So this Brahman is the light of lights, that which shines first into the dark places and is the radiance of all else. Uh, once again within the Bali Canon we saw the Buddha himself at his birth and declaration his radiance eclipse all the radiance of all the gods put together, and his shining, his radiance, his glory, fills even the darkest realms of creation. For some individuals a question might have arisen uh, throughout this study, because we've only been looking at the Pali Canon, which is the Theravadan texts, and there are other uh, denominations of Buddhism who recognize other scriptures. Um, we chose this collection, the Pali Canon, primarily, again, as I said at the beginning, because it itself forms the most ancient text that we know of the Buddha. So we will now look at, uh, for those who are interested, uh, some of the quotes from the Mahayana scriptures themselves. This first one here is from the Lotus Sutra, a very, very prominent sutra in Mahayana Buddhism. The hero of the world is unfathomable among heavenly beings or the people of the world, among all living beings, none can understand the Buddha. From the Lankavatara Sutra, the Dharma Datu, absolute truth, abides forever whether the Tathagata appears in the world or not. So the Buddha himself is unfathomable, <laughs> higher than all heavenly beings. Again, this is exactly the notion we see within the Kanu Upanishad. And the absolute truth, the Dharma Datu, that body of the Dharma that is represented in the Buddha in the world of creation, abides forever whether or not the Tathagata appears. So this entity, whatever it is, this absolute truth, this ultimate reality, exists in some way whether or not it is manifested in this world. Clearly uh, a corollary with the concept of the manifestation of God within the Bai writings. The next quote is from the Lotus Sutra again. If the form of a voice hearer is what is needed to bring salvation, he manifests himself in the form of a voice hearer and proceeds to teach the law. If the form of a Pratyeka Buddha will bring salvation, he manifests himself in the form of a Pratyeka Buddha and preaches the law. If the form of a bodhisattva will bring salvation, he manifests a bodhisattva form and preaches the law. If the form of a Buddha will bring salvation, he immediately manifests a Buddha form and preaches the law. Thus he manifests himself in various different forms, depending upon what is appropriate for salvation. And if it is appropriate to enter extinction in order to bring salvation, he manifests himself as entering extinction. Uh, we saw this in the Pali text when the Buddha gives the example of the great assemblies of the Maras, the Brahmas, the Yama gods, the Nim Nimarati gods, uh, that he himself will actually present himself to these beings in the form that they are, so that he can bring, and in this context, salvation unto them. This concept of the Dharma Datu, the ultimate reality, the absolute truth itself, manifesting in the form of whatever uh, form those who he's teaching to, uh, really echoes a part of the Bhagavad Gita that we will look at at a different time, where Arjuna, in the Hindu text of Bhagavad Gita, asks Krishna to show Arjuna his true form. And when he does, there is this like unbelievable image of like numerous mouths, uh, unending faces, ears, eyes, and hands. It's this expression, in my understanding of the text, that Krishna, who is the embodiment of Brahman, um, as Vishnu, manifests in so many different ways, in so many different forms, at so many different times, that when Arjuna sees his true form, all he sees are the rolling faces and manifestations of that absolute reality, which the Buddha himself again tells us he does here. The next is from The Perfection of Wisdom in 8,000 Lines. Tathagatas, the eternal Buddha, certainly do not come from anywhere, nor do they go anywhere. 
because suchness does not move, and the Tathagata is suchness. Non-production does not come nor go, and the Tathagata is non-production. One cannot conceive of the coming or going of the reality limit, and the Tathagata is the reality limit. The same can be said of emptiness, of what exists in accordance with fact, of dispassion, of stopping, of the element of space, for the Tathagata is not outside these dharmas. The suchness of these dharmas, and the suchness of all dharmas, and the suchness of the Tathagata are simply this one single suchness. There is no division within suchness, just simply one single is this suchness, not two, nor three. Uh, echoing the Baha'i scriptures, uh, that son of reality is beyond descent and ascent, really beyond any description itself, and that here the Buddha is saying that the reality limit, that which is the essence, is itself the Buddha. Now from the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. The supreme complete enlightenment is the realm of Nirvana. The realm of Nirvana is the Dharma body of the Tathagata, the eternal Buddha. Attaining the absolute Dharma body is attaining the absolute one vehicle. The Tathagata is not different from the Dharma body. The Tathagata is identical with the Dharma body. The absolute is unlimited and unceasing. O Lord, the Tathagata, who is not limited by time, is without limitation. His great compassion also is unlimited, bringing peace and comfort to the world. His unlimited great compassion brings unlimited peace and comfort to the world. This explanation is a good explanation concerning the Tathagata. If one again speaks of the inexhaustible Dharma, the eternal abiding Dharma, which is the refuge of all, Therefore, in a world that has not been saved, a world without a refuge, there is an inexhaustible, eternally abiding refuge equal to the utmost limit, the Tathagata, Arhat, completely enlightened one. This is such a fascinating quote because actually we see that Nirvana itself is the Dharma body of the Tathagata, the real essence and true reality of what the person of the Buddha in our time really is. That there is no difference because the Tathagata, the Buddha himself, is identical with the Dharma body, which is unlimited and unceasing. This being, the Buddha, is not limited by time. His compassion is not limited. Again, this, this relational love and compassion towards the creation which he reveals himself to, and he is the inexhaustible refuge of all reality, or Brahman. Now from the Garland Sutra. Buddha abides in the infinite, the unobstructed ultimate realm of reality, in the realm of space, in the essence of true thusness, without birth or death, and in ultimate truth, appearing to sentient beings according to the time, sustained by past vows, without ever ceasing, not abandoning all beings, all lands, all phenomena. In the first section of this quote, we have to really look pass beyond, if you will, the veil of names, and see what the Buddha is expressing himself to be. Infinite, unobstructed, the ultimate realm of reality, ultimate reality itself. That he is without birth or death, the Alpha and the Omega, <laughs> he who is ever abiding. That he does not cease, and he does not abandon all beings. And in, within this non-abandoning, it says, he appears to sentient beings according to the time sustained by past vows, the concept of the eternal covenant within the Baha'i scriptures. These past promises, these past vows, are what actually sustain the continuing return of the Buddha, the everlasting covenant. How should enlightening beings see the body of the Buddha, the Dharma Kaya, the body of the Dharma? They should see the body of Buddha in infinite places, why? They should not see Buddha in just one thing, one phenomenon, one body, one land, one being. They should see the Buddha everywhere. Just as space is omnipresent, in all places, material or immaterial, without either arriving or not arriving there, because space is incorporeal, in the same way Buddha is omnipresent, in all places, in all beings, in all things, in all lands, yet neither arriving nor not arriving there. 
because the Buddha's body is incorporeal, manifesting a body for the sake of sentient beings. Just as we are told within the Baha'i scriptures that all of reality is in a sense a reflection of the Divine Being, and that his attributes can be seen everywhere, here we are told that the Buddha is, quote, the Buddha is omnipresent, and that he had it, that Dharmakaya, that body of the Dharma, manifests a body for the sake of sentient beings. Again, a direct parallel to the concept of the manifestation of God within Baha'i writings and within the Upanishads itself. Once again to the Lotus Sutra, Kashyapa. You should understand that the thus come one is like this. The thus come one is the Buddha. He appears in the world like a great cloud rising up. With a loud voice he penetrates to all the heavenly and human beings and the asuras of the entire world, like a great cloud spreading over the thousandfold, millionfold lands. And in the midst of the great assembly he addresses these words, saying, I am the thus come, worthy of offerings, of right and universal knowledge, perfect clarity and conduct, well done, understanding the world, unexcelled, worthy trainer of people, teacher of heavenly and human beings, Buddha, world-honored one. Those who have not yet crossed over, I will cause to cross over. Those not yet freed, I will free. Those not yet at rest, I will put at rest. Those not yet in nirvana, I will cause to attain nirvana. Of this existence and future existences, I understand the true circumstances. I am the one who knows all things, sees all things, understands the way, and opens up the way, preaches the way. You heavenly and human beings, asuras and others, you must all come here, so that I may let you hear the Dharma. At that time, living beings of countless thousands, ten thousands, millions of species come to the place where the Buddha is to listen to the Dharma. The thus come one then observes whether the capacities of these living beings are keen or dull, whether they are diligent in their efforts or lazy. And in accordance with what each is capable of hearing, he preaches the law for them in an immeasurable variety of ways, to that all of them are delighted and are able to gain excellent benefit therefrom. The Buddha here in the Lotus Sutra manifests as a great cloud, a great cloud rising up, <laughs> like the Torah. In this same notion, we also see the concept of Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven, that he actually comes to all these different worlds and all these divine realms, be they low or high, out of his desire to release all. When he does so, he appears in a way and teaches in a way that the denizens of that realm, whatever it may be, can truly understand. Because he actually sees the reality of the world in which he is. He is a divine physician who diagnoses the cosmos in which he manifests and then teaches his law to those people in accordance with where they are at. The concept of progressive revelation in this world and beyond. We're now going to look at two final quotes. Uh, the first one is from the Brahmanet Sutra, another Mahayana. Um, it is rather long, <laughs> but we will actually do our best to try and keep track of the imagery that is actually being expressed here. Um, this is the Buddha beginning to speak. I have cultivated this mind ground Dharma door for hundreds of eons. My name is Varakana. I request all Buddhas to transmit my words to all sentient beings so as to open this path of cultivation to all. At that time, from his lion's throne in the lotus treasury world, Virakana Buddha emitted rays of light. A voice among the rays is heard telling the Buddhas, seated on thousands of lotus petals, you should practice and uphold the mind ground Dharma door and transmit it to the innumerable Sakyamuni Buddhas one after another, as well as to all sentient beings. Everyone should uphold, read, recite, and single-mindedly put his teachings into practice. After receiving the Dharma door of the mind ground, the Buddha is seated atop the thousands of lotus flowers, along with innumerable Sakyamuni Buddhas, 
all arose from their lion's seats, their bodies emitting innumerable rays of light. In each of these rays appeared innumerable Buddhas, who simultaneously make offerings of green, yellow, red, and white celestial flowers to Varakana Buddha, and slowly took their leave. Now I, Varakana Buddha, am sitting atop a lotus petal, on a thousand flowers surrounding me are a thousand Sakyamuna Buddhas. Each flower supports a hundred million worlds. In each world the Sakyamuni Buddha appears. All are seated beneath a Bodhi tree. And this is the tree under which the Buddha received enlightenment. All simultaneously attain Buddhahood. All these innumerable Buddhas have Virakana as their original body. These countless Sakyamuni Buddhas all bring followers along as numerous as motes of dust. They all proceed from my lotus pedestal to listen to the Buddha's precepts. I now preach the Dharma, this exquisite nectar. Afterward, the countless Buddhas return to their respective worlds, and under a Bodhi tree proclaim these minor, major and minor precepts. Avarakana Buddha, the original Buddha, the precepts are like the radiant sun and moon, like a shining necklace of gems, Bodhisattvas, as numerous as motes of dust, uphold them and attain Buddhahood. So in this image we get from the Brahmanat Sutra, there is a supreme singular Buddha. That Buddha which is the source of all the teachings, of all the physical Buddhas in the form bodies that appear in all these different worlds, is the inspiration of the revelation of the Dharma into all these cosmoses. This Varakana Buddha is the source of all the rays of light, like the Sun of Truth that we find within the Baha'i writings, um, that itself is the inspiration of all the manifestations that we see in the physical form within all the worlds of God, and are here known as the Buddha himself, as Krishna, as Muhammad, as Jesus, the Bab, and Baha'u'llah. This entity, known as the Logos, or the Primal Will, or the Manifestation of God, is the ultimate source of all these reflections, if you will, these fractals, these, uh, these manifestations within the world. And this is totally in accord with the concept of the word taking on flesh, that original entity who is the perfect sorry, who is the perfect reflection of the Divine Father manifested in the world. We've come to the end of this study. That's just, what have we actually learned? Right from the get-go, philosophically, because Buddhism itself teaches unto humanity principles of honesty and justice and compassion and truth and right view and right effort and meditation, and in this case, eulogizing, homaging, and prayer, right from the get-go, Buddhism actually seems to be monotheistic. We couldn't possibly at any time have called in my opinion, Buddhism non-theistic, because the actual Buddhist scriptures themselves really actually represent within them endless layers of actual divine beings. If anything, with a cursory knowledge of Buddhism, we would have called it polytheistic, or a concept of many gods. But we find out that actually the Buddha himself was the reality limit, the knower of all, the seer of all, the one true stainless one, is actually at the very top of reality, and eternally is the refuge of all. That whether or not this being manifests in the world, which this being does in accordance with the capacity of the people he's teaching, that ultimate reality, the Dharma Datu, the body of the Dharma, is itself ever abiding, fully conscious. And it is our job in life to find the reflection of that ultimate reality, that Dharma, as manifest within our world, and follow his law, and draw close to him through his teachings. Uh, put in this way, and really looked at from the Buddhist scriptures itself, we see Really the concept of actually, whether it's the Logos and the Father and the manifestation of Jesus Christ, or the different natures of the manifestation of God embodied within the Baha'i scriptures. I think it's really fair to say that the idea that uh, Buddhism is a philosophical system that is not really interested in transcendent realities, 
that is really just a means of actual psychology can be completely laid to rest. And the idea that the Buddha was agnostic about ultimate reality too can be laid to rest. We are dealing with a religion that is actually truly placed within its own uh, cultural milieu and is responding to issues that we can find within the Vedas and the Upanishads and actually is echoing or reflecting concepts we find even within the Bhagavad Gita, that there is an ultimate reality that actually manifests itself for the raising up of sentient beings when unrighteousness has come to prevail. That being is actually a form body chosen by this ultimate reality in order that it can actually communicate to its patient as a divine physician in accord with that being needs. This is the concept of progressive revelation fully expressed. So I think in the end here, can we say that Buddhism itself has an ultimate reality? Yes. Is that entity itself personal? like the Brahman in the Kenu Upanishad? Yes. Is it the refuge that we have to seek out, have faith in, love and approach? Yes. It is in the end, God.